What's going on guys? I'm Karen Star, Healer Main and Final Fantasy XIV Raider, and it's finally time to analyze and rank all of the Endwalker raids. I'm going to make a tier list of all 15 fights and break down why they place where they do. But first, we need criteria. These raids are going to be ranked using five main factors. Their prog experience, mechanics, difficulty, optimization potential, and most importantly, fun. Now, I very rarely PF, so if your PF experience causes you to disagree with where I rank these fights, or you just disagree in general, let me know down below in the comments. Also, if you like what you see, please click both the like and subscribe buttons. I genuinely appreciate it. Now let's get into it. Tears started off with Eric Tony, who used to be a jailer in WoW, but came over to Final Fantasy XIV as part of the Exodus. P1S was very straightforward to prog, with most of the mechanics being directly transferable from the normal mode, and if you forced your tank to take a damage down, maybe you should have stuck with the normal mode anyhow. Intemperance is a really solid mechanic for the first floor, and this mechanic led to one of my favorite prog moments ever in our initial clear. There wasn't much to optimize here, minus some silly black mage position swaps I did in second Intemperance to maximize the burst window, as the fight was generally just a striking dummy. One could argue that it was honestly a bit too easy for a savage fight, but it also wasn't annoying to re-clear. P1S was fun in a junk food sense, and a great way to practice and learn new jobs. It gets a C, which I'm going to be using as the average. Next up was the dead sewer puppy, P2S. I like this fight a lot. It wasn't difficult, although some of the raid wides hit harder than you'd expect, and the mechanics themselves weren't revolutionary, but the arena itself made them interesting. So many fights in Final Fantasy XIV feature a square or circular arena, and the character position positioning you can use to solve mechanics all blends together after a while. P2S, however, cut the arena into unique shapes and forced you to be precise unless you were a tank who couldn't resist the allure of the poo water. Sausage Cut was a solid uptime strat, but beyond that, any optimization potential wasn't anything to write home about. Progging this fight was also amusing as my co-healer's gear broke toward the end of the clear run, and we still pulled it off even though she couldn't heal or survive a raid wide. This fight gets a B. This next one might make some of you see red or orange, I suppose, but I really liked P3S. The colors that everyone complained about endlessly never bothered me, and I thought the step up in speed, the 50-50 variation on a lot of the mechanics based on boss tells, and the capstone mechanics of the fight were all genuinely interesting. This was the first Endwalker fight that was difficult to prog and could still catch you in reclears, and it was also the first Endwalker fight that felt truly rewarding to optimize as a healer. I hate to tell you guys, but this fight was an A. P4S is where things get a little personal. We all have our strengths and weaknesses as a raider, and one of mine is that my brain is genuinely not good with true north orientation. In the heat of battle, to me, east just means right, and west just means left, regardless of where I'm facing. So yeah, Frog was a little brutal. The mechanics in this fight are varied and interesting, and toward the end definitely demand that you heal, but there are also enough wipes to snapshots and tether jank that it started to get annoying by the end. Optimization started out enjoyable with some strat changes that were fun to learn, but the short length of the encounter really pushed the sandbag parse meta to the forefront, which is easily the lamest thing about Final Fantasy XIV I can imagine. Any fight where your individual ranking gets punished for playing well as a team and killing the boss as fast as possible gets an automatic fail from me on the optimization front. When good play isn't rewarded, parses are more or less meaningless. Some of you may say that they are in general, but to me at least, optimization such as speedrunning and parsing extends the playability of content, and in my opinion makes the game more enjoyable for a longer period of time. Just, you know, not in this fight. So it gets a B, even though it arguably deserves better. The P4S final boss, however, was definitely more fun for me. Healing had to be precise during certain moments. Act 2 is a fantastic mechanic with great uptime strat potential. A few of the mechanics demanded exact movement and specific timing, and Curtain Call is one of the best in rage sequences in the game with how interactive it is. It was stressful to heal initially, but then when you zero GCD healed it for the first time, you felt like an absolute god. There are acts that are way too easy, and as a recurring theme, the door boss was definitely tighter tuned, but this final boss was fun to prog, fun to execute, rewarding to optimize, and for me, it gets an A. Asphodelus overall was considered at the time a very straightforward tier that was relatively easy because it was the first from the expansion, and in hindsight, that analysis holds up pretty well. What surprised me a bit is how fondly I look back on it. I know people place P3S a lot lower and the P4S door boss a lot higher, but this is my tier list. You can always argue with me below. What you can't argue with is that DSR came out right after this and was a fantastic ultimate fight. Final Fantasy XIV rating was in a great place and things were looking up. Unfortunately, up next was Abyssus, and we'll start with P5S. P5S was a pretty decent fight with one main exception, 
Devour. Devour was not fun to prog, it isn't fun to do in reclears, it isn't fun to do in optimization, and conceptually, it shouldn't even exist in the first turn of a tier. Hard pass-fail body checks belong later down the line, and as a healer, having them at all completely takes away the thrill you get from recovery situations. Yes, I know that there are ways for a tank to save a run from one person dying, but that hardly makes things better. Oh, and I was awful at Devour. It's weird because otherwise I enjoy the fight, but there are mechanics that are difficult and rewarding to overcome, and mechanics that are difficult and just annoying to deal with, and Devour is definitely the latter. It gets a C, but really it could have been higher with just one mechanic deleted. P6S, however, doesn't get the benefit of the doubt. P6S was awful. It was not fun to prog, it was not fun to optimize, it is not fun to execute. It was this weird combination of not challenging or difficult at all, not interesting, not enjoyable, and one of those Final Fantasy 14 fights that allows you to cheese its capstone mechanic. Most groups just tank or healer LB Kachexia 2, never having to actually do it. My group skipped it completely week one. You should not be able to skip defining mechanics week one. That's just bad game design. Optimization was a disaster too, because while there were some interesting new strats, the entire fight was a kill time nightmare, which meant sandbag runs were the norm. There is nothing less fun than sandbag runs. This fight took a massive L on Prague, an L on mechanics, an L on difficulty, an L on optimization, and an L on fun, and is one of the worst savage fights ever designed in my opinion. It immediately goes into the dumpster, where both the boss and the boss's haircut belong. At least after you got through it, there was a light at the end of the tunnel, right? Wrong. P7S is another garbage tier fight from an overall trash tier raid tier. The first six middens are essentially the normal mode encounter, followed up by a mechanic that was fun to prog but trivialized soon after, and capped off by somewhat interesting mechs at the very end of the fight that you can simply disrespect and healer LB3 through, even week one. That's how we cleared. The hardest part of P7S is staying awake until the final one third of the fight, but then in optimization, you don't even get to experience that. It wasn't fun to prog, it wasn't fun to optimize, it's only interesting mechanics were trivialized through poor design decisions and poor pacing, and it's one of the easiest third turns in memory. It is also garbage, and it's hard for me to decide which of P6S and P7S I dislike more. Maybe tell me what you think down in the comments. Which fight was worse? Honestly, both P6S and P7S could have been first turns, while P5S felt more like a second, so this entire tier's design and balancing was completely off. Which of course leads us to the P8S door boss, which I have incredibly mixed feelings on. Even though my team did not get the week one clear, we successfully beat the P8S door boss three times week one. We still only hit a clean and rage one time that I can remember with our near but non-meta comp, so while there's no denying that the DPS check was tight, I also didn't think it was unfair. The difficulty of the DPS check and the precision that it required was genuinely enjoyable to me. I never had to spreadsheet an entire heal and mid plan during prog before in order to get as close to zero GCD heals as possible simply to maximize team damage. Prog is a massive W for P8S, and other than people being greedy with their snake gazes, the mechanics are also very good. Where this fight falls off hard is in optimization and how that negatively impacted fun. P8S has two distinct timelines, snakes first or legs first, which is genuinely cool. RNG in Final Fantasy XIV fights can be a lot of fun and very refreshing. What isn't cool is that one of the two timelines is objectively better for both speed and optimization. This meant that every single pool, there was a 50-50 chance that you would just end up running into a wall as a team to reset a minute or two into the fight. How this worked in reality is that you'd have eight pulls in a row where you would just reset, then your brain would melt, and then finally on a good pull, someone would make a dumb mistake that they never typically would, or they would greed their snake gaze and ruin the run for everyone. It was the most deflating optimization experience I've ever had. So what do I do with a fight that was so rewarding to prog, but also made me quit optimization for the entire tier because it was that unfun? I'm gonna call it a B. It deserves to be an S or an A from prog alone, but it also probably deserves a D ranking for the rest of it, so I think a B is generous. The P8S final boss doesn't get that benefit of the doubt though. Wall bosses in general lose a couple points because I think it's lazy design that further trivializes the melee role, as if massive hitboxes and 100% uptime fights aren't bad enough. And while the P8S final boss has some cool mechanics, the coolest are during complete downtime, and the few it has mostly just repeat. And let's not even bother with the Phoenix buff, which interacted 
played with the enforced two minute meta and over reliance on crit as a stat, turning the phase into an inconsistent DPS disaster. Oh, and all of you people who thought it was hard to see mechanics in P3S, that was towers for me. They blended into the floor. And at the end of the fight, it isn't a particularly cool time to throw the run. One thing in its favor is that it was genuinely interesting to heal early on. The first few minutes of the fight alone are difficult and the debuff players get can be spooky if on a healer or caster. Still, that doesn't save it. And it gets a D in my opinion. There was so much potential here. Simply making high concept and uptime phase and putting the boss in the middle of the arena would have dramatically increased its score. But missed potential just about summarizes the entire second tier of Endwalker. P5S is so close to greatness, but Devourer is both an annoying mech and unnecessary downtime. P6S was comically dull and undertuned. Why not have a Kachexia variation every minute, or at least every two minutes? Imagine having a distinct Kachexia based mechanic at one minute, three minute, five minute, seven minute, and nine minute. And as they progress, they combine elements of the previous mechanics, so each time you have to factor in a different variable. That's a fun fight that holds up over time. Along those lines, why not spread the very end of P7S throughout the fight? Why not program purgation so that it can't be cheesed? Why not make the fight faster overall, like 3 and 11 both are, and tighter so it feels like a proper challenge? Why not make both timelines in P8S distinct but equal? Abyssos was easily the lowest point in Final Fantasy XIV raids since I started raiding, and it really impacted how I felt about the game, the effects of which I'm still feeling today. I even made a video on burnout because I just wasn't having any fun. Heading into this most recent and Savage tier, my expectations were admittedly pretty low. Luckily, Yoshi P and the fight designers came through. P9S is a perfectly acceptable first turn. I wish that it was full uptime and that the Proteans and Meteors mechanic occurred more than once throughout the fight, and I'm not sure I understand the inclusion of the baited 1 through 4 numbers at the very end of the fight, as it's not particularly interesting, but it's alright, which is kind of what you want and expect from the first turn in a tier. First fights need to be engaging, enjoyable, and easily beaten when compared to the others, and I think p 9 S checks all of those boxes. It'll be interesting to see how optimization plays out once everyone is BIS, and will probably involve planning around the downtime like in P5S, but for now, this fight's a C. Perfectly acceptable. Next up is P10S, which is a strange one. It has an unusual floor shape, which immediately earns it points. It has a lot of different mechanics, some with visual tells, some with cast bars, and some with debuffs that still somehow mesh together thematically, and also gets it points. My main question is, why is this fight so hard for a second floor? There are so many moments in P10S where if one person messes up, half of the team is almost immediately dead, and if you can't get them up quickly, the next mechanic will definitely wipe the raid. P2S wasn't anywhere near that tight, and lord knows P6S wasn't either. But beyond that, P7S wasn't that brutal, and we haven't gotten there, but P11S isn't that punishing either. Harrowing Hell Alone is one of the most difficult heal and mitigation checks of the entire expansion, and it's in a second turn. I'm not taking points away for this, and in fact, P10S gets a thumbs up for it, but even this many years in, Square Enix still can't seem to get their floor-to-floor -floor progression correct. P10S is easily more difficult than P11S, just like P5S is more difficult than P6S and P7S. Also, the Chariot and Dynamo snapshots on the drop-down ads are complete nonsense. They are so much tighter than other snapshots in the game. I'm giving this fight a B, but man does it feel like a third turn, not a second. Speaking of the third turn, we mentioned it a little, but P11S is a perfectly acceptable and decent fight, and you already know that means it's a C. But let's talk about why. Because because this fight doesn't do anything particularly wrong, but it also doesn't do anything that interesting, and it suffers from a comparison to E11S, which is a similar fight, but better executed. The concept here is a handful of mechanics that rotate throughout the fight, have RNG elements, and build on each other over the course of the encounter. These are all great things. The rotational mechanics, though, aren't different or distinct enough to be interesting. E11S was definitive. Lightning Cleave was out, Lightning was spread, and Lightning Target meant that the tanks had to stand on either side of you. Fire Cleave was not back, fire was partner stack, and fire target meant to stack with the party. All of these grew and built on each other over the course of the fight, culminating in cycles, which you had to do all of them in rapid succession. In P11S, however, dark sometimes means stack with your partner in a dynamo, but also sometimes means stack with your partner within the cleave, and sometimes just means dodge into the cleave, and the whole thing kind of blends together. The casts are all very similar, and eventually you're on autopilot and have no idea where you are in the timeline. Instead of cycles, which were objectively cool in E11S, you get a final final key mechanic that's just marginally faster than it was the last time, and comes with a knockback jubate, and the coolest mechanic in the fight with the near-far color tethers only occurs once, and it feels like it's progressing at half speed. The whole thing's just kind of boring, which is fine for a first turn, but on a third, I expect more. Fittingly, however, it's ranked right there with the other first turns of the tier. 
The P12S door boss, however, is the defining savage fight of the expansion, in my opinion. This fight has more than enough RNG to make it fun and engaging pool to pool, but not the kind of RNG that makes half of the pools miserable. It has a strong enough heal and mitt check, but not one that is brutal or unnecessarily punishing. Mechanics that build on each other, a variety of different strats, and it demands precision and speed in a way that a final fight should. It isn't perfect. There are elements of the adds phase I disagree with. For example, the order in which the adds spawn doesn't really matter if you just count laser beams, and it's annoying when standing on one pixel means you live, and standing just one pixel closer means you wipe. And also, this fight doesn't have any DPS check to speak of, even during week one. But the fight's fun. Prague was difficult but rewarding, the micro-optimizations we've done so far have been enjoyable, and as a bonus, the arena and boss designs are just really nice to look at. This is an S, and it's not even particularly close. Everything that is fun about Final Fantasy XIV exists within this fight, and I expect this to stay at the top of most lists for years to come, right up there with some of the best savage fights of all time. Finally, we have the P12S final boss. It loses points for being a wall boss. It loses points for towers into tethers with a half room cleave, which are fine as mechanics, but aren't particularly fun. It loses points for the caloric one week one bug, which was pretty deflating during prog. Lastly, it loses points for not even remotely having a DPS check, even in week one clears. Luckily for the fight, it earns points for almost everything else. Whether or not the UAV mode was intentional after the top drama, it's pretty hilarious. And while it wasn't implemented perfectly, movement speed feels super weird when you're tiny, it's great to see Square Enix try something new. When you try something new, even if you don't hit it out of the park, you're still up there swinging the bat. You can still learn from failures and near misses and grow from them in the future. The shapes are kind of neat, but then they come back with a vengeance toward the end in a great sequence of events that inverts not only the shapes, but the order the mechanics go off. Caloric is a genuinely fun puzzle to solve, and I like that part of the strategy in solving it is that you have to slow down and not panic or rush to a spot. It subverts your expectations from the fast twitch door boss both times it occurs and it's wild to see people crumble under the pressure of a very deliberate and straightforward mechanic. The enrage sequence UAV2 is not quite as engaging as P4S curtain call, but it's infinitely superior to P8S towers. I think this is an A, and while maybe that opinion drops over time, it's still going to stay in the upper echelon of Endwalker fights. So let's look at the list and see if anything doesn't feel right. S is correct for me. There's unfortunately only one fight of that caliber in this expansion if you don't count DSR. The rest are a bit hard is P3S better than P2S and P10S? Are P4S Phase 2 and P12S Phase 2 better than the P4S and P8S door bosses? Only time can really answer those questions. Two expansions from now, I may remember these differently, and it'll be interesting to see if that's a result of boomer memory issues or nostalgia, or if something takes place in 7.0 and 8.0 that can change my perspective. In the meantime, let me know what you think down in the comments below. What adjustments would you make, and where do you think I'm way off?